9, chapter number 9, we'll begin reading in verse number 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be, might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now we have just read the tail end of a rather long story that I'm sure that all of you are glad that I did not read every bit of it from the beginning of chapter number 9. Uh, this is the account of the man that was blind from birth receiving his sight. It was by the side of the road or by the wayside begging and Jesus came by his way, spit in the dirt, made clay, put it on his eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam and that he would receive his sight. The man did so. Then he comes back into town and everybody that knows him, they're saying, hey, isn't that the guy that used to beg on the side of the road? And they said, no, nah, he, he looks like him, but that's not him. And then he started saying, no, it's me. And they said, well, hey, wait, a big commotion comes up. They take him to the Pharisees. And they say, behold this thing which has been done. And they say, how did you receive your sight? And the short answer was, he said, well, a man came by and he said his name was Jesus. And uh, he put clay on my, told me to go watch in the water. I did it. Now I can see. And they had quite a long debate, uh, the Pharisees did, between themselves. Because some said, how can a man that is sinful, because he made him, in their eyes, they thought he was a blasphemer, because he had made himself equal to God. Uh, I believe it's the chapter after this that uh, he says, I and my father are one. Right? They sought to stone him then. Well then, others of the Pharisees said, hey, people that are of sin can't do miracles. Right? Something, something about this guy, you know, it's real. And so they brought in this fellow's parents, the guy that was blind from birth. And his parents said, we weren't there. Ask him. Now, they said that, but the Bible says, and makes it clear, in... Where was it? Yeah. Uh, verse number 21. They said, by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. His parents knew, but they withheld because they feared the Pharisees. They knew that Jesus had come by. I'm sure one of the first places he went was somebody go show me my house. Right? And then his parents, I'm sure that he told them. But their response was, we weren't there. We don't know how all this happened. He's of age, ask him. So then they called him back in for the second time, and they asked him again, how did you receive his sight? He said, I already told you all this. He said, we've been over this. And then he gets into a little bit of a theological debate with them. We'll get to that here in a minute. But then down in verse number 34, the Pharisees, after they had heard his answer the second time, they said, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and doth teach us. And they cast him out, meaning they cast him out of the synagogue. Right Now to be put out of the synagogue in that day, it meant that you were an outcast from society. Okay, The synagogue was not the center of the city as far as business was conducted, but if you were branded as someone that was a heretic or a blasphemer or something like that, and you were thrown out, people wouldn't give you money if you were a beggar. Okay, people wouldn't fellowship with you. Because in the modern day times, you were marked as either unclean or you were marked as someone that spoke out against God. And for fear of the Jews, just like his parents, people wouldn't associate with you because they feared the wrath of the Pharisees. Because if you were called associate, you'd be put out of the synagogue. And not just that one. All synagogues. If they had heard about it at a different synagogue, they wouldn't let you into that one either. Okay, it wasn't like nowadays where 
somebody will go to a church cause trouble and then just hop on down the road and cause more trouble but anyway then in verse number 35 where we start to read Jesus heard that they had cast him out of the synagogue and when he had found him he said unto him dost thou believe on the son of God okay now let's just backtrack a little bit here he knew that somebody had come by he being the blind man knew that somebody had come by had spit in the dirt but well, he may not have known that he even spit he just knew somebody put something on his eyes told him go wash in the pool of Siloam and then you'll receive your sight and then he did it now keep in mind this guy's blind still how did he get to the pool of Siloam I did. So I was reading I was thinking well Jesus gave him the instructions but he still by faith had to exercise his belief in what Jesus had said I thought of the man that was lame who was brought by four friends to the house where Jesus was they took the roof off of the house in order to lower their friend down into it and the Bible said in that account that Jesus saw their faith referring to his friends and that because of their faith their friend was healed and then as that man took up his bed and went back home we've already preached those four men didn't go with them they stayed and repaired the roof of that house that they had taken off in order to lower their friend down because men that did things if they cared enough about a man to take the roof off they cared enough about the family in that house to put the roof back but this man blind somehow find his way to Siloam did he find a stranger and say hey you headed by Siloam can you show me the way keep in mind he's got mud caked all over his face at this point somebody either had pity on him or he had a good friend or perhaps even his parents he said it doesn't make sense but I need to get to the pool of Siloam you're not going to understand why. a man came by said his name was Jesus in his name Jesus' name had been made famous throughout the region at this point everybody had been talking and they said are you sure it was him I don't know I didn't see him but he said he was and he said if I go wash in the pool that when I come up I'm going to have sight and he did it but then imagine he sees for the first time since he was born never seen but he gets his sight back how does he know which way is home how does he know how to get back to where he was I can imagine him walking past the spot where he used to beg and he said I know that it's this many steps this way this many steps this way that many of this and then I'm at the spot where I beg but he's sitting there and looking at it and he's saying this place looks a whole lot smaller than I remember it being right all those times that he's wandering around town with a hand against the wall maybe or somebody's leading him and he's thinking man this city must be huge and then he sees it and it's a whole lot smaller he's like wait I can see my house from here wait a second that's my house he didn't even know where his house was right can you imagine seeing his parents faces for the first time but instead of doing all them things what do we find him doing as soon as he gets back before he has a chance to go sightseeing people in roundabout verse number 8 the neighbors therefore and they which before had sent him or seen him that he was blind said is this not he that sat and begged some said this is he others said he is like him but he said I am he he didn't even get you know done with the tour he's still trying to figure out what red and orange and yellow and everything else is and people are saying aren't you that blind boy others say no then he says yeah it was me and then the questions start well how did it happen how did it happen right he answered said a man in verse number 11 that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me go to the pool of Siloam and wash and I went and washed and I received sight then they said unto him where is he he said I don't know he told me to do and he left I don't know where he went then verse number 13 they brought him to the Pharisees and then once he was in the Pharisees, Pharisees started saying that Jesus was of a devil because he healed on the Sabbath right we don't have time to get into that but then they start asking him questions asking him questions 
Well, here's the thing. This blind boy, he was schooled a little bit. He knew some things about the Word of God. Because we get over to verse number 25, and this is after they're asking him, you know, they said, hey, let's just start in 24th. They again called, they the man, <coughs> they again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man, referring to Jesus, is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. He says, in other words, proof's in the pudding, boys. I was blind, he told me to do, and now I see. He's saying, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I'm not. He said, I didn't even see him. I just heard him. But I do know that when I did what he said, something miraculous happened. Then he goes on to say, in verse number 26, they said, then said they to him again, what doth he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I've told you already. And he did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? In other words, I've already told you you didn't believe me once. You want me to tell you again so that you will believe and that you'll go out and tell others about him? That was a rhetorical question. He knew that they weren't going to do that. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man, the blind man, answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. This guy knew a little bit about God. First off, he goes back and says, Have not we been taught from the beginning? There never once has been recorded an instance where someone that was born blind was or received their sight from any man. He says, But this guy gave me my sight. So we know at the bare minimum that God's with him. Because he didn't do it, God did it. Well, at the same time, he did do it because he was God. He's pointing at him and saying, it's not just whether he's a sinner. You guys need to understand that he is God. Okay, but then he also says, now you know that God heareth not sinners. True. If a man regardeth iniquity in his heart, God will not hear his prayers. Sin prevents us from communicating with God. Unrepentant sin in your life will cut off the blessings of God. We know that God doesn't hear sinners. He says, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now see, this blind man had never seen, you know, it was custom at that time that men that were of age would get up and read what nowadays the Hebrews would call the Torah or they would read from the prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They would get up and they would read so that others could hear because they didn't have copies of the Word of God in every household. It was a great honor for a man to stand up and be able to read the words of God to those in his community in the temple at that time. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they would get up and they would teach. But most of the time they would just reread what had already been pinned down. Well, this guy had put some math together. He had never read it. But he had sat and he had heard it at some point. Because he had started drawing some connections. He said, we know that if you worship God, well, in order to worship, Jesus told the woman at the well, those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. All right, that was five chapters before this. So he knows in order to worship God, you've got to be right with God. You can't worship God when you've got an ought against God in your heart. If you've got sin in your life because that puts you at enmity with God he's saying so in order to worship you must first be sin free not by your own works but according to what God said at that time it was sacrifices right through sacrifice your sins could be forgiven and then for one yearly sacrifice where that spotless lamb 
was taken and you know its blood was applied to the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, their sins would be pushed back for a year. They were forgotten for a year. Well, John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin. Ours are gone. But he's saying, you got to deal with sin first before you can worship. And then he says, if you really are that concerned about worshiping, that your life's right with God, you're going to do the will of the Father. That's the next thing that he said. He says, verse number 31, But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will. Okay, now, in order to worship, you got to be right. But between worshiping and doing, you can get wrong. Right? He's saying, if you continually worship, you will do. But if you do both, it says that God will hear you. He had figured that out. So I'm convinced long before Jesus ever came by his way, he may not have been able to make a living on his own with his hands. Right? He may have been blinded and he may have relied upon the mercy and the grace of others in order to feed himself. But he found out a long time ago that if he just worshipped God and did his best to do what God... It didn't matter what people would do for him. He knew that God would provide what he needed. And when Jesus came by his way one day, because of his faith before, that's what gave him the faith to believe in Christ when he came by and said, hey, go watch in the pool of Siloam. He said, okay. A man without faith wouldn't have followed. But he did. He had never seen the Word of God. He had never seen the house of God. He had never seen a sacrifice performed. I mean, keep in mind, at that time, if you brought an animal for sacrifice, the priest would prepare it for you and put it upon the altar. But how's this man going to raise animals on his own? Because under the law, that's what you were supposed to do. You had to keep your own animals that you would offer up under sacrifice for God. That's why Jesus drove the money changers out. Right? There was no dedication to their sacrifices. They treated it just like going through a drive through Well, I don't need to keep my own animals so that I can have sacrifices unto God. I'll just buy them. Well, how do you ensure the quality of the sacrifice when you're just relying on somebody else's word? That's a whole different lesson. Because under the word of God... The animals that you offered were supposed to be the best. The first fruit. Right? But if you're just buying what that guy's got, that wasn't your best. But yet this man somehow had to find a way to have sacrifices. For his I believe he did his best. Don't believe that, you know, under the day and the time, maybe his father, like Job did, where Job offered up sacrifices for his children daily. I don't know if his father did that. But I do know that this guy knew a little bit about God. He had never seen anything. All he had to go off of was what he had heard. Because they wouldn't have entrusted him to make the sacrifice with his own hands. Right? Why would you give a blind man a knife and put him next to a fiery altar and say, okay, best of luck to you. Right? That's not going to happen. Right? He's never read the words that were pinned down from long ago on what thus saith the Lord. He just had faith that what he had heard was true. So then when we get down to verse number 36, when he answered Jesus after Jesus said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Now he had heard Jesus say that he was Jesus. I believe it was a very short conversation. But we do know that he recognizes that Jesus is somebody because he called him Lord. Lord, who is he? Now, I don't know if he recognized that it was Jesus, but he recognized that Jesus was somebody because he called him Lord. He said, there's something about this guy. But he had never seen, but he wanted to know who the Son of God was. I don't know who he is. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now nowhere in there does he say, It's me, and my name is Jesus. Now, does he know that he's Jesus? I don't know. Does he remember what his voice sounds like? I don't know. But without hesitation, 
the Bible says and he said Lord I believe and he worshipped him now again cannot worship God if you got sin this man had had his blindness taken away but he had yet to be forgiven for sin Jesus said do you believe on the son of God first he was believing to receive his sight now Jesus comes back after he had heard that he had been put out of the synagogue why was he put out of the synagogue because he just believed that Jesus was from God he said y'all are crazy he says of course I profess that Jesus is Christ he says he did the one thing that man can't do give sight back to a man that was blind from birth he says and y'all are wondering whether or not he's a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath day all I know is, is that those that worship God do the will of God God will hear them he says and this guy's talking with God then when Jesus had heard that he had heard not only did he have faith to be healed he had faith that somebody he had never seen someone that he may have heard about but when Jesus came to him there wasn't a long theological discussion there on hey before you believe I just want you to know that I was born in a manger of a virgin that you know at the age of 12 I dumbfounded the Pharisees and the scribes in the temple of Jerusalem because I've only been from everlasting and I started talking about the book that I'd pinned down and it blew their minds he didn't go through all the miracles that he had done up to this point he just said go and watch in the pool and he did it but then when he was cast out of the synagogue that was faith that he rejected what the Pharisees were teaching because he knew that they could not do what Jesus did he said I know that that man's right with God so I'd rather follow him that was faith to reject everything that he had been taught now see he knew what was true because he said in order to worship God and do the will of God if you do that God will hear you but he doesn't hear sinners he knew that God's word was true he no longer trusted in the words of the Pharisees and by rejecting their dogma Jesus heard well that boy's just got faith in what God says not in what man says so he comes back to him and says do you have faith to be saved to believe on the son of God and he said Lord I don't know who he is I don't know where he is Jesus said you're talking to him and you're looking at him and he said Lord I believe fell down and worshipped him that's the first time that he had ever worshipped with his sins entirely being forgiven but see the other group Pharisees verse number 34 they answered and said unto him thou wast altogether born in sins they looked at this man as being afflicted with blindness from birth they saw that as punishment for great sin I'll remind you I mean we could go over two chapters to John chapter number 11 when Jesus receives word that Lazarus was sick and he stayed there for two days after he received the news and then to his disciples he says we got to go down there Bethany and they said but Lazarus is sick he said Lazarus sleepeth they didn't get it they thought that he had just fallen into a coma or something or he had taken a long nap but he was talking about he's in the grave but I've got power over the grave he's just asleep right now but he said that this illness was brought about so that God could get the glory right yes it was a result of sin that this man was blind the sin in the garden but there's no evidence that because his parents had committed a great sin or because God knew that this man was going to be a wicked man in his life that he afflicted him with blindness from his birth this man was given blindness so that God could get the glory this man in one day has done more to talk about God and to witness about the true message of God than the Pharisees had done in their entire life yet they look at him and said you are a man that was altogether born in sin well we can go over to Romans all of sin and come short of the glory of God 
So what does that say about the Pharisees? Do they believe that there were tears of sin? That because they weren't born blind that they were better than this guy because they had less sin in their life? Did they believe that because this man stayed blind that he must be wrong with God? Because I believe that he knew more about talking to God than the Pharisees did. He understood that in order for God to hear you, you've got to have a pure heart before Him and worship Him. And then obedience to go out and do. Maybe he had heard the account of Samuel and Saul where Samuel said obedience is greater than sacrifice. Maybe he couldn't make sacrifices because he didn't have the means to. But maybe he understood that obedience was greater. That Lord, you know my limitations, but I can follow your instructions. Maybe every time somebody gave him some coin or maybe some bread, what if he recounted one of the stories that he had heard in the temple about something that Elijah had done or something that Elisha had done. Something that Moses was you know, instructed of God to tell others. And he's just giving them a word fitly spoken. Hey, God bless you. And because you've given to me, let me tell you about what I've heard at the temple. I don't know. But I honestly believe he did his best to follow after what God told him to do. Because if he hadn't, maybe Jesus wouldn't have come by his way. We know that many accounts, Jesus talks about those that were Gentiles that came to him, and he said, I have not seen faith like this in Israel. So if this Israelite didn't have faith, maybe Jesus wouldn't have come by his way. It wasn't the fact that Jesus didn't want to help people that they didn't get help. It's because they didn't have faith to believe on him. That's why they didn't get help. And we've gone through all of that to get down to verse number 39. Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and they said unto him, Are we blind also? They were talking about visual sight. They thought that what he just said was, I've come to make all blind people see. To bring judgment. And he says, but I've also come to make them that see blind. So what they're asking is, is they're saying, please tell us that we're one of the blind ones. Because we want to be made to see. Jesus tells them in verse number 41, If you were blind, you should have no sin contrary to what they believed. They thought blindness was a result of sin. But he says, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore your sin remaineth. He's talking not about physical blindness. He's talking about spiritual blindness. He came to bring light to the... The light dwelled in the world and darkness comprehended it not. Those that claim they can see in darkness... They're really blind. But those that understand that they can't see and they're looking for a light, they're the ones that find that light and their sins are forgiven. But when he says, ye say now, we see. Therefore your sin remaineth. They thought they knew what it took to be right with God. He was saying, if you were just as blind as this boy, that boy didn't know much and he knew it. But he did know what God said and he believed it. And he said, because he just had faith, and instead of questioning all the things he didn't know, he just believed what God said, that's why that boy's sins are forgiven. If you were as blind as him when it came to spiritual things and understood how little you really know, then you too would be without sin. But he's saying, those that claim they can see already think they have the answer. They think that they don't need anything. Sounds a lot like the church at Laodicea. We are increased with goods. We have much and have need of nothing. They had seen a little bit and they thought that was enough. Instead of having faith, they were holding on to what they were taught. 
and hoping with everything that it was enough because somebody gave him a position but I studied long enough now I've got a title surely I know what's right I learned from the best of the best of the best surely that means that if they you know the smartest men in the world if they knew it was true surely it's true but see the Pharisees had taken the simple instructions of God and twisted them and turned it into a hierarchy turned it into a social system to where man was at the top of the food chain the Pharisees well I find that the way God delivered it to Israel Israel's king was supposed to be Jehovah wasn't supposed to be a man in fact they had such little faith in God that they said Lord give us a king we want somebody we can see somebody that we know someone that we can look at and know that's who we're following they had little faith and when they got a king they put faith in man rather than God but those kings that worship God that follow the instructions of God God heard them and because he heard them he took compassion and grace and mercy and dumped it out on Israel and still blessed them because the one that he had exalted to be king still just followed after him Saul thought he had it figured out when he was small in his own eyes God exalted him but when he got too big for his britches God humbled him David as long as he sought after the Lord's heart Israel did well but when he disobeyed he had to pay the consequences same for Solomon even in Solomon's old age he bowed down and worshipped false gods and then from there on out is a coin flip either Israel was doing against God or Judah was doing against God but from then on out they looked to man and then they were overthrown they were taken into captivity they learned the ways of other lands some went back and said restore us but through it all they thought they had figured it out the Pharisees and as a result they were blind and they were not blind because of sin they were blind because they made themselves blind they were blind because they were stubborn and would not hear and they tried to question the directions, the instruction the teaching of the very son of God looking for ways to show that he was a sinner right? how you know, deluded do you have to be that you can sit there and watch somebody do a miracle and say he's of the devil because that happened a few times that he sit there and teach about what the prophet said and then you go back and try and catch him in a lie like that's how resilient they were to admitting that they were wrong pride puffeth up and they were puffed up but see Jesus said if you were blind in other words if you knew how little you know you'd have no sin in other words you'd believe like that guy just believed he said but because you say we see therefore your sin remaineth well I wonder just like those Pharisees how many people nowadays think that they've figured everything out that they need to know about God they come into church and they say well that was a great sermon for somebody else or they hear something preached on and they say well I got it figured out I don't need that or that doesn't bother me like the preacher says it bothers me here's a little fun fact for those of you that got iPhones I don't know if you do it like I do I've got a little thing a weekly report comes up every Sunday morning shows me how many hours a day I average on my phone throughout the week now take that number and cut it in half what if you devoted that to God because I mean if I can do it on my phone I can also do it on my laptop and I can do it on my iPad so if it's I'm not checking emails 12 hours a day right we hear the pastor preach on you know technology becoming our new habits well really break down how much time we use and then look at God and say yeah I need to do all the things that I'm doing on my phone well in order for God to hear you, you can't have iniquity in your heart 
Well, if you're devoting all the best time to something else, but then you come in and you hear it preached against, you're making yourself blind. You're stabbing out that part of your vision and saying, that's not a problem over here. You make yourself blind to where you don't see it and God can't deal with you about it. Those that are blind know, Lord, I'm a sinful man conceived in iniquity. Right? Born into iniquity. I'm a sinner by nature and a sinner by trade. Lord, I know that I don't have it figured out. So show me. Those that come in meek and humble and say, Lord, I need to hear from you. They make themselves blind. In other words, they understand, I don't know. I don't see what I need by my own account. Lord, open my eyes to what I need. Those people walk out having done business with God. Those people walk out having their eyes opened unto what God wants them to see, maybe for today, to get through the week, maybe to change something in their life that will have a lifelong impact. But that doesn't happen if I come in and say, well, this is what I want from God, and if it's anything else, I'm not going to pay attention. I've heard that preached before. Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever think that? Well, maybe you need to hear it again because you didn't hear it right the first time. Lord, if it's being preached, I'll listen. And Lord, in those times where He's going over things that I've already heard, Lord, check me. Maybe I remembered it wrong. Maybe there's something that I've paraphrased it down and left something important out. Lord, show me. I mean, there's that song. Not really all that big a fan of it, but they did get one premise right. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I am blind. Make me to see. Because let's be honest. How far can we really see? Anybody know what's going to happen the rest of this day? Anybody know what you need to do tomorrow to be right with God? Besides going down the checklist of, well, I need to read my Bible. And so, no, I'm talking about in order for you to be in the perfect will of God, what do you have to do tomorrow? Nobody knows. Tomorrow's not even promised. Those that wake up and say, well, I know what I need to do today, you might have made yourself blind. Because instead of asking God, Lord, show me what I need to do today. I mean, I know that there are certain things that I have to do, just like that man said, in order to worship God, you already got to be right with God. Right? There are some things that if you do them, you're not going to be right with God. And unless you do them, you're not going to be right with God. But I'm talking about those intricate details of well, what if the Lord wants me to witness to this person. But right? we get into the habit of, well, I know what I need to do today. Do you really? You may get it right today, but what about tomorrow? What about the day after that? When we make ourselves blind, we don't rely upon what I think I need to do or what I know I need to do. Lord, show me what I need to do today. Never do you find. I mean, the very next chapter, Jesus talks about Him being the good shepherd. Him being the door that the sheep have to go through. And once they go through, he, they find pasture that the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep, but a hireling would run when the wolf comes. Right? That Jesus desires to give his sheep life and life more abundantly. That's in the very next chapter. But where do you ever find that a shepherd gave a sheep a road map? Sheep can't follow directions. They can just follow what they see. But when I'm blind, I see with spiritual eyes. Lord, show me the way that I need to go. You want to walk hand in hand with Jesus? You want to follow in His footprints? Stop trusting in what you know and just rely on what He shows. Lord, show me how to follow. Show me where I need to go today. Instead of, all right, Lord, I think I know what I need to do today. Can I get a check marker and X? That's not faith. That's you putting in all the effort and hoping that God's pleased with it. When he says his yoke is easy, there's very little figuring out and playing in ahead of time on how you're going to do this or how you're going to do it. Well, what if God just wants you to do something out of the ordinary so that somebody will take notice? 
I was thinking today, I don't know, it might have been last night. It was either late last night or early this morning, one or the other. But I was thinking, that word peculiar, we're called to be a peculiar people. You know what peculiar means? It stands out. And we think stands out, that's somebody that stands up in a crowd. No, no, no. Peculiar means you can't miss it. It's like one of Christian's Hawaiian shirts. They're ugly, but you always see them. He buys them just to make Taya angry. Right? And he gets them for like $3 off of the clearance rack because nobody else wanted them. Right? He comes in wearing one of them and you're like, whoa. That's peculiar. You can't miss it. Well, I wonder why so many of God's people today aren't peculiar. They understand that they need to live a separate life. And we say, well, we don't commit abortion. Right? We haven't killed anybody this week. We don't rob from anybody. Okay, we come to church, we pay our tithe. But that's not peculiar. There's a lot of people that don't know God that do that. And praise be to God, we still, for the time being, live in a country that has moral values in our laws because it was founded off of the oracles of God. So to be an upright citizen in the United States, you're already following some of what God says. It's not enough to do what everybody else does and expect that they would see it. You know where you become peculiar? When you say, Lord, I don't see. I don't trust my own eyes. I see through a lens of pride. I see through a lens of what's best for me. Lord, my eyes can deceive me. My own heart's deceitfully wicked. I don't know what tricks it's trying to pull. Right? It, you can pull the wool over your own eyes. And Jesus is saying, if you don't rely on him to open your eyes, then, he told that, those Pharisees, your sin remaineth. Well, what sin or what iniquity remains in our lives because we are too set on what we know. We don't want our apple cart upset. And as a result, we never let God get down to business and those things that he wants to deal with remain not saying you're not saved not saying you're in the wrong church but I am saying that you're not what God wants you to be and really when you think about it if we aren't what God wants us to be what's the point in even trying if we're not peculiar if we're not one of those chosen generations a royal priesthood salt of the earth and light of the world that's what our purpose is in the eyes of God. If we don't do it because we've blinded ourselves, we're without excuse. I've, I've read more of the Bible probably than that blind man ever did in his life. Because even after he got saved, after God gave him his sight, he still didn't have a copy of the Word of God in his house. But that man was a greater witness in one day than the rest of the Pharisees in that temple had probably been their whole life. By publicly saying, I choose Christ over the temple. Well, after the Holy Spirit came, he became a tabernacle for the Holy Spirit. He could worship him whenever, wherever. Right, you say, well, this guy, he was recorded in the Bible. Yeah, because he understood how little he knew. Half of it hadn't even been told. I can't even figure out what's wrong with me, let alone somebody else. I can't even figure out how to go through a day without messing up. So why would I think that I know what I need to do today? That I can figure out what God wants me to do? That I can figure out how God wants me to do it? You know what this guy had? Zero hindrances. Because he understood he was blind, that he knew little. But what he did know, he knew to trust God. And he just did. When what you think or what you know or the logic that you have gets in the way of faith, you don't need it. Because if you stop trusting, you're going to stop growing. And your eyes will become dim. And when you've blinded yourself, there's nobody to blame but you... But God can't help you until you realize I've made myself to where I can't see anymore. 
Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.